Welcome everybody. Tonight's event is part of a series of artist talks made possible through the FEP grant from Broward College Student Life. In addition to the lectures, each of the artists will also be giving a free workshop on the following day. You can find brochures on your seats to save the dates for the next speakers. There's still three more in the series. Each of the talks will be videotaped and posted on YouTube the following week. You will also find surveys on your seats. If you have time after the talk, please fill out a survey and we'll pick it up from your seats. The surveys help us with future grant funding. Uh, our speakers tonight are Peter Simons and Leah Brown. Peter and Leah are both artists and collaborate as curators. They are the dynamic duo behind the contemporary art projects at Fat Village Arts District. Peter Simons was born in Ireland and immigrated to the United States at an early age. He received his bachelor's degree from the Rhode Island School of Design and his master's from Pratt Institute. Peter creates artworks with the newest of technologies, including video holograms and brain mapping. When talking about his artistic process, Peter states, it is a mental process to impose definition and distinction upon the visual field. When I look without thought, the, wor the visual world shifts, objects fade away, and the visual field reveals itself to be a unified field. In some ways, the act of perceiving is an act of creation. We create a map that overlays what is seen, one that defines objects, places, and all perceivable things. This map differentiates the unified field. Leah Brown is a sculptor and installation artist whose object-oriented work questions the assumed hierarchical structures of reality through the creation of elaborate tableau. These installations induce reoccurring dream characters and ongoing narrative that assumes the active agency of the dreamt figures themselves. Brown was born in Washington, D.C., raised in the mountains of North Carolina, and based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She received her BFA with honors from the Rhode Island School of Design and is an MFA candidate in the sculpture program at University of Miami. Recent honors include the Black Broward New Times Mastermind Award, the 2012 Low Art Museum Award, and the 2013 South Florida Cultural Consortium Fellowship. Brown's work is featured in Contemporary Sculptors 84 International Artists and part of the Girls Club Art Collection. Peter and Leah will be giving a free workshop tomorrow at 2 p.m. in casting and mold making across the street at the art building. Please join me in welcoming Peter and Leah. Thank you so much, Lisa, for inviting us to talk today. And thank you so much, Broward College, for hosting us. This is a really amazing program that you put together, and we are thrilled to be a part of it. There's this button. Hey, okay, there's our slide. Um, so Peter and I both have um, very individualized um, artist practices, and oftentimes our work is very different. So um, what we wanted to do is kind of show you what our journey has been like over the past 13 years, um, working as independent artists that come together as each other's artist assistants and um, our biggest critics oftentimes, and how that's really um, turned into a practice that involves uh, curation and involving the uh, artistic community. So I thought we'd start with some of um, our early work. This is some of Peter's. So um, with this piece, um, well, that was terrible. Um, with this piece, it's a found object sculpture where I took these um, bridge building bolts found in a scrap metal yard, welded them all together. The structure is based off of the diameter of the bolt versus the diameter of the head took those same bolts, recast them individually in a polyester resin so that they were also functioning bolts and sort of rebuilt that on top of it, sort of like the earthly becoming the sublime. Um, it sort of, I think, okay. Um, it's a, it, it was one of the first pieces where I really started to explore like, you know, very strict geometries and setting up rules for a sculpture in order to then see how far I could take those rules. 
The next piece is a piece called, um, I never really titled this piece, I always just call it Mirror Ball to myself. But it's, um, the idea is it's a truncated mirrored pyramid. The red fabric at the bottom, when you look through the um, truncated pyramid, it creates the illusion of a sphere, sort of a continuous sphere. Um, so then I tried to recreate that illusion in real life by recreating the grid of squares. But as you can't make a grid of squares, it breaks down at the ends and just uh, becomes this approximated object. This piece I feel like um, started to uh, become my interest in uh, optics, which kind of followed through in a lot of the later work. The last very early sort of undergraduate piece I was going to show was this piece. And in this, uh, there's a lit, um, sort of like a light box image um, project that's placed behind a set of stir straws. I was a bartender at the time and I was bored, so staring through a bunch of the uh, drink straws. Um, the optics that it was able, it um, blurred the image in such a way that you could only really appreciate the image from far back and it created this effect where you kind of, your relationship to the piece affected how well you could see the piece. Um, one piece that Leia and I both worked on together was, and we've still been working um, in similar vein, was this web. Um, when we were at RISD during our undergraduate, we were given sort of uh, two floors of this abandoned space in downtown Providence, and we decided to take over the stairwell. And we took over the stairwell. We took um, bundle tape, which is generally used for pallet wrapping and that sort of thing, and we just started wrapping everything in the stairwell, tying in objects into the space to try to create a um, a, an environment or a, almost a cave, kind of like um, Hirshhorn's Man Man. Caveman Man. Um, and uh, the next piece. So around the same time, um, and you can see how, how different our work is when we first started actually working together. Um, I was creating this piece. I call it Bound. Um, it's actually a functioning violin. Um, so. Uh, the sound box is uh, hand-carved wood, and the scroll is a cast bronze, and then all of the fittings are to the um, exact measurements of a violin. So, um, you know, I was really kind of dealing with my issues of, um, of music and understanding who I was in the world, and um, with this piece, I felt like I could actually become the instrument. In fact, the only way that um, the piece, that the the violin can be played is if someone else is to play it, since my hand is cast into the scroll there. This is a um, life-sized uh, spider person. <laughs> That's um, my face and hands, and it's got a welded steel armature, and the rest is sculpted in plaster and fiberglass. Um, really still working with these ideas of understanding who I am through what I'm not, dealing with issues of, you know, being afraid of spiders, but also starting to think about um, dream imagery as well. You know, I found that um, oftentimes I'd have nightmares about this one particular spider person, and uh, creating it became a kind of outlet for me that uh, in my later work would take on kind of a whole life of its own. Here's a detail. I call this piece Catter Baby. <laughs> He's about three feet tall, three feet wide. Um, uh, it's plaster, and actually, my grandmother was a doll maker. And when she died, she left me all of her doll making supplies. So I kind of felt like this was a collaboration between her and I. I actually took a latex mold off of um, the head and feet of one of her little porcelain baby dolls, and then um, used the repeated moldings to create Catter Baby. So, it was around this time, this is after graduating college and going back to live in Asheville for a couple of years, that um, Peter and I were figuring we better kind of up our game a little bit. We had gotten, you know, we had gotten a duo show at a local <coughs> gallery and we figured, you know, okay, that's it, we graduated college, we're artists now. So we were like mentally totaling up how rich we're going to be when we sell out everything <laughs> in the show. But it turned out there wasn't a huge market for half spiders, half people. 
Go figure. So, um, so Peter went to grad school at Pratt, and I went on to um, take a year-long artist residency in, uh, in Spartanburg, South Carolina, uh, called Hubbub. Um, this was the first year of the program, and I was so very excited to be, um, you know, in the inaugural year. It, it's a, Spartanburg, South Carolina, it's a small, small southern town, it's a railroad town, and um, it, there was just, uh, they were kind of remodeling themselves with the image of having contemporary arts at their core, which is a wonderful model, and the program is still around to this day. In fact, I see a lot of what look like artists out here today. The program is still in existence. You should definitely apply for it. It's wonderful. Um, they basically give you a year uh, to live free and create. So I was making um, like large uh, installations. This is actually a stage set. So you can see it's like denim uh, sewn together for the sky and like green gloves for the grass and uh, painting those trees. Um, but I really kind of wanted to use this time to make myself over, to really make myself anew. And I figured to do that, the best way would be to, you know, take these kind of sculptural representations and just, you know, kind of see what it would be like to see, you know, my own dead body, actually. So with this piece, this is a face casting and a hand casting and a mannequin and a wig and doll parts, not doll parts, um, uh, found clothes and things, here's a close-up. Um, so it really did look kind of like a dead body that I put out in the mud. And I just left it there, you know, it's gonna be like, okay, once this piece is over, then I'll start fresh, and I can be this new kind of artist. Um, but then it sort of took on a life of its own that I hadn't really expected. Uh, people in the community started bringing in flowers. The, um, the head of the program had contacted the police so that they wouldn't respond to any calls of a dead body. But um, what we didn't expect was that there would be um, construction workers coming. So actually, that's a site from, from up above. One of the other artists in residence, Brian, ran in while I was giving a critique to some students. And he said, there's people down here, there's people. So I ran out with my camera and snapped this picture real quick before I had to run back down. Um, and when I came out about an hour later, um, they had actually destroyed the piece, just absolutely ripped it, literally limb from limb, like they tore the wood, they broke all the fingers, tore apart, I mean you can see it's like, it's destroyed. And it was such a bizarre reaction for me. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that was that piece. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then actually I ended up collaborating with one of the artists in residence there, Brian Hitzelberger, um, to create this other piece that actually had a much <laughs> better response from the community, luckily. This is called Scarecrow Wedding. And it's about 40 life-size scarecrows um, that we created and stuck in this swamp along the Cottonwood Trail there. Just this lovely nature trail, kind of out of the way. We had a wonderful little reception for it, and it just, um, just kind of lived out in the swamp. You know, it was... Um, it was really at this time that I began realizing how important it was for me to get the right reaction out of my audience. And, you know, the artist community there, they all knew I was doing this project, but most of the rest of the town, they had no idea. Um, they would just use this trail for fun. And one guy told me, he told me he went for an early morning jog, and it was misty. And in front of him, this little black dog ran across his path. And it made him take pause, and like all of a sudden he got goosebumps. But he kept going, he turned the next corner, and there was Scarecrow Wedding coming up out of the fog. And he literally stopped and asked himself, am I in a dream? And I realized that's what I wanted, you know? We dream every day, and when we're in the dream, we have no idea that we're dreaming. But we don't really consider it. We don't really consider that to be part of our human experience. So in thinking about those kind of ideas about consciousness, unconsciousness, the mind, what it's capable of, I did um, a sort of performative piece that ended up being a, a book, about a 150 page book called The Constant Conversation. This is the uh, dust jacket for it. And what I was trying to get a handle on was that little voice 
that's always going through your head. And unless you actively kind of stop it um, through meditation, you're always going to be having that constant conversation with yourself. So I thought, how can I, how can I get a handle on you know, all of these words? Like, I can barely remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday, but I'm having these constant thoughts. So I thought about automatic writing, the way that Surrealist did, but it was kind of too slow. So I was thinking if I could just talk and talk and talk um, and dictate that, that maybe that would give me a better grasp on what that conversation is. So that's exactly what I did. I trained my voice to be able to talk for um, an entire day. And I spent the entire day, it was 13 hours, actually, exactly, um, sunrise to sundown, where I spoke my every thought um, that I was capable of. You know, you think faster than you can talk. Um, but I spoke constantly the entire day and then spent the next two weeks recording that into, um, or uh, transcribing the recording into this, into this book. And, you know, I would absolutely recommend this experience for anyone that wants to try it because it's so amazing to relive all of those memories. You know, it wasn't like I'd actually forgotten it. That was all still there. When um, Leia was doing her residency, I was invited down to put on a show. Um, so I traveled down from New York and got to experience her artist residency for a little while, which was, um, and for that I created a web installation in one of the corners where I kind of see them as like three-dimensional drawing in space where you can just really freely create form and shape. Um, I took that same idea and took all the objects from my studio and wrapped them into the ceiling to create these sort of crystalline structures, which probably annoyed everybody else in the studio since I took all their stools. But um, it was sort of a very instant, very quick way of just generating form and building shapes. Um, at grad school, you um, spend a lot of time researching theory and reading, you know, fairly dense uh, papers on art. And it sort of, in some ways, kind of pared down my practice and made everything a lot more um, simple. This piece I took, um, I think it was about 30 castings of my head, painted the back of them to blend into the floor as if they are either coming out of the floor or sinking into the floor. Um, and sort of the paint behind them almost is their wake. The, and then earth in the center, and I call this the earth drinkers. Um, and, you know, again, it sort of focuses on that idea of like a heavy um, geometry and sort of letting the process become the product. This is a piece I did actually out of my parents' farm where I took, we used to paint houses to uh, work our way through college. So I took all our old step ladders, which are all fairly, they're not actually that old, they're just very well used. Um, and just arranged them into an arc, to, which sat at the bottom of their field for quite some time. Um, for my thesis show, I uh, began to work on this piece, which I call uh, In Pursuit of an American Ideology. And in this piece, I have this camera basically recording this sheet of asphalt that I've created. And underneath that sheet of asphalt, I've planted crocuses. And you can see there's a little drain there that I can water the crocuses with. And the idea is it's recording and it's seeing what will happen with the hopes that these crocuses will be able to punch through the asphalt and flourish. Um, they never actually did that. but. There was the hope, <laughs> um, which it actually can happen on occasion, and sort of this idea that you can recreate this adverse effect and try to bring about this like um, myth of like you can overcome whatever obstacle you're faced with was the idea behind that piece. So it was actually at that time that Leia finished up her um, residency, and she came up to New York to join me. And so I was so excited to go to New York and be an artist up there with Peter and you know do my thing. So I got a job working as um, <laughs> a professional elf sculptor. That's a job. <laughs> it turns out um, uh, it's uh, for the Christmas windows that they have every year in the department stores like Macy's and Hudson Bay and. Um, there's one company that does it all, and it's uh, all these wonderful animatronic um, little things. So I got to go and be an elf sculptor for a little while. Mrs. Claw, actually. <laughs> but the real reason I was so excited to be in New 
New York, is that some of our friends from RISD had started this, um, this group, this collective called the 3D Group. And um, they had such a wonderful thing going on. Uh, they invited us to be part of their first big show. Uh, they had found um, a, a backer, essentially, who um, had rented them out. Well, it wasn't even rented. He was paying all the costs for this wonderful um, like penthouse loft in a building that was going to be um, demolished. It was slated for demolition. But um, it was... It was, on it, was in, it was in Tribeca. Yeah, it was in Tribeca. Yeah, so it was, um, you know, it was the top floor of this building. It had great, like, overhead lights and wide open spaces. And it was, it was in rough condition, but it was a beautiful location, and it was a very, it was a beautiful space. It was so cool. So we just got to be in this amazing, huge, like, art studio and create these, like, these big things. And this was going to, this was supposed to be our breakout show. At least that's what the, the guy who was funding it was telling us. He said he was going to um, purchase everything in the show and then um, put it back on the market to increase its market value. So we were, you know, once again thinking, like, this is it. This is the moment. Um, and uh, this is the piece that Peter made for the show. So for this show, I created this... Um painting where um, I machined all the stretcher bars out of acrylic and stretched a clear vinyl over it and the whole thing hangs on the wall as sort of this ghost painting where all you really look at is the wall behind it but it sort of really explores the object that is the painting. And this is the piece that I made for the show. I called this one Super Target at the time. <laughs> Representation of the New York experience here. <laughs> Um, so we were just having a great time with this, and then I um, was invited to do another brief residency. Uh, so I went off right after that show opened to create uh, Lavinia and the Birdman. Um, this is in another town in uh, South Carolina, the little town of Sumter. And when I went there, what was so amazing, it was cotton season. And the whole air just smelled like cotton, which if you've never smelled fresh cotton, it smells decadent. It smells like flowers. It's wonderful. So I had to do something with that. And so I used what found objects I could find in just the cotton itself to create, um, to create this installation. While I was there, though, um, the all the elves got installed. And um, it turned out that uh, the, uh, the backer for our show, who was actually um, the uh, primary fundraiser for Hillary Clinton's campaign, got into some big trouble. There was, I don't know if you remember, in 2008? <laughs> I think so. There was the controversy where he was, you know, somehow not reporting where his money came from or getting more money than he should from people. And he got into a lot of trouble, and he basically, all of a sudden, all his money was gone. So we had no more funder. And we were basically left empty-handed with this big show. And, um, you know, it was, it was hard. It was cold, and it was winter. So I got a job as an art fabricator. Now, did you guys see the piece? It was in um, Art Babel, I guess, three years ago or so. This is Butt Plug Santa. <laughs> this is the first piece that I worked on as an art fabricator. And you don't really know yourself until you stand at a butt plug that's four feet high. <laughs> Four days, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, there's that. Um, when uh, when Peter finished up grad school, he actually came to work at this fabrication company as well. And there's no real better way to get good at something than just sanding it repeatedly for four weeks. So we would have to make these um, skull flowers, and they were. Um, sometimes cast uh, fiberglass, cast you know carbon fiber, or even like a four-ton resin, and basically you would have to sit there and sand those things for about two weeks straight, so all the reflections of them are just perfect. So you, they can be completely flawless. So it would actually, and it was the first time we ever got to work with such materials. Like how often do you work with carbon fiber? It's like a hundred dollars a yard, but you know when Paul McCarthy wants his, you know, well use my language, but when he wants dick and I cast in carbon fiber, you cast in carbon fiber, and that's the actual name. But, um, but it did give us, it introduced us to a wide range of materials, to a wide range of processes, and in some ways it was like a 
second education and that it was this very, very useful education. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't just standing, you know. Um, I think when we were in... This is, this is another piece. This is a Richard Jackson um, sculpture. It's in the Rebel Collection right now um, called Dick Stuck. Um, <coughs> but with these pieces, it wasn't just, you know, that it was a production, but it was very much... Um, that the artist in question would give us a drawing, and then it would actually get sculpted from scratch. So um, there was a team of maybe 10 of us all together that were creating pretty much all the sculptures that were coming out in New York in 2008. And it was, it was so interesting to see like, the kind of style that was created because it was coming out of a company. Um, but it was also very, you know, it was kind of an insight into the inner workings of like the high-end commercial art world. And I really started to kind of dislike this postmodern practice of outsourcing ideas. You know, and the way we started to feel about it was that art really should be a conversation between the artist and their materials. You know, that's where that's where you learn how the piece should be. It tells you how it should be, and that's where you explore your concept. You know, it's a very different thing if, you know, you just have an idea, you sketch it on a napkin, you say, make this for me, four feet tall and red, and then, poof, it's there at your opening, and you're we, seeing it. We did get sketches on napkins, too, which was really funny. And a lot of times the artists would come to visit, and we would have to, like, you know, keep them from messing up their artwork. <laughs> <laughs> it was really interesting. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't like working for the artist, it was like being the artist's hands. Um, and in many cases making those kind of creative decisions that really they should have been making in my opinion. So I started seeing it less as, um, as art actually and more um, as design. That's me standing a, a Richard Jackson sculpture. He probably made me the angriest just because um, I had shown him my portfolio with like all these animal people, <laughs> and then he's like, "Oh, why don't you sculpt me a horse-headed person?" So I cast my hands into it, <laughs> just to be a jerk, because I always cast my hands into work that like I want them to be me. Um, so that's it when it's finished. That's the, the laundry room scene, um, and actually the character with the boar's head, um, who's figured in black there, um, the head sculptor. You know, he was working on this piece. And, he was actually, you know, really getting into it. His name is Georgi. He's this big Bulgarian guy. And, uh, you know, he didn't really care about art, but I would always pester him, like, you know, what is this? Is this art? And he said, you know, finally he said, the artist isn't the artist, and I'm not the artist, so this isn't art. And that was really kind of what I took away from it. But, you know, it was still a really wonderful learning experience, and I don't think that we would kind of be doing what no. we're doing today without it. No, I think I think, you know, it was it, even learning the things that weren't so great was actually a good learning experience. Um, but it was also at that time, um, it was right at the start of the economic downturn. And we noticed that on the board that had the list of jobs, there was a point at which. There were no jobs past that certain point. So we realized we, it would probably be a good idea to get out of Dodge. So we, um, I started working for Florida Atlantic University for the School of Architecture down here, working with their um, you know, digital fabrication equipment and their manual fabrication equipment. And while I was doing that, um, Leia came, Leia was obviously with me, and we, she began looking around on Facebook, and one thing we discovered was this posting. Craigslist, man. Yeah. I became a Craigslist junkie. <laughs> it's like, how are, like, we moved here thinking, like, okay, Fort Lauderdale, because we're in Fort Lauderdale now, like, Fort Lauderdale is so close to Miami, like, it's going to have a booming art scene, there's Art Basel, it's going to be amazing. And then when we looked around, we're like, oh, man, you know, where are all the artists hiding? We couldn't really, we couldn't really see them. So I just started, you know, looking for spaces or opportunities, and what came um, what came our way actually was this building. I don't know. Did you ever get to go there, Lisa? You done? This is the this is the, what became 18 Rabbit Gallery, and um, I saw this little posting on Craigslist saying, you know, 
downtown building, warehouse, free for rent, give me a call. So I gave this guy, <laughs> you know, kind of sketchy, but I gave the guy a call, and it turned out that, um, you know, he's just an eccentric guy, and he just wanted to kind of give back, and, you know, he thought maybe it'd be a good business plan to let someone in the recession just take on a space and see if they could make money with it. And he actually had um, tried to start a gallery once before. This is the inside when he still had it. He just had tons and tons of this stone sculpture. So he was already There's really into art. All of these crates are just filled with stone sculpture. And all that stuff back there is all stone sculpture. He had bought a container, like a shipping container, just full of stone sculpture that was sitting in the space. He loved this stuff. Very heavy. <laughs> it was really heavy. So he moved all that and put up real small. And, um, you know, we never intended to start a gallery. That was never what we were thinking to do. But then, I mean, we had looked back at, like, the 3B fiasco. I mean, they stole this guy's TV when they got mad at him. And we were like, oh, we would have handled that so differently if only we could have, you know, could have been in charge of that situation. And then we saw what they had done at Hubbub in South Carolina where they had really kind of like envisaged this artist community and made it happen. So we were thinking, you know, if, you know, if this isn't the way we want to be, maybe we can work a little bit to change it to how we want to be. So on the outside of the building, we had uh, made some friends with some people who are into murals and graffiti. And we basically had them just wrap the entire building. And I think it might have actually been the first full mural put up in um, in Broward County. So uh, we had... Spray paint. In spray paint, yes. Um, we had uh, this group MSG come up, which was like Miami style graffiti, and they wrapped the entire building. The only issue, the only um, constraint we gave them is that it couldn't have words. Um, so this was one put on by Hawks and Angel. And um, so inside, we tried to push like a contemporary art um, gallery in downtown Fort Lauderdale. So this show, which we called Environmentalism by Proxy, was or sort of investigation of what, not just the idea of environmentalism, like we all need to recycle, but like what looking at environmentalism as a, as a thing unto itself and examining that whole idea. And you know, wait, you know what that piece is right there? Oh yeah, that's Amy Gross. Isn't <laughs> this was from our show Fireworks. Uh, this was a uh, Korean artist from New York that we brought down, and she did a performance during our inaugural show where she um, made this clay vase, uh, wrote these um, uh, Korean script upon it, and then filled it with water until it exploded. Um, it just dissolved because it was on fire. Um, this is um, Blaine Siegel's work, and it was all based around the idea of the Pacific Trash Vortex. So this, um, he created this monster creature in the middle of the uh, space that would activate whenever you went by. And his working on this myth that, you know, in an imagined future where creatures began to evolve from this Pacific Trash Vortex and create a life of their own inside of there. This is another view from our inaugural fireworks show, and I actually started experimenting with CNC routing. So I made this blue um, foam piece in front of it by just cutting out the same profile over and over and over again. And you can see Jim Kim Chung's work in the back and some other people we brought in. Um, then again, this was part of the environmentalism by proxy. The, we had a series of cookies down the wall. Each of them said, reduce, 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 with a little pedestal next to it with a little pitcher of milk. So you could come up and, you know, take your glass of milk and, you know, digest your message and feel good about yourself. <laughs> there were lipstick stains on the wall. It was great. People really got into eat um, do you want to talk about these views? Sure. That's that's another view of. Actually, we invited Blaine to come back and do um, a whole installation based around his um, inflated bag sculptures. So this is actually um, the inflated view. And when you walk through the space, there would just be a pile of what looked like trash on the floor. And then when you walk past a motion sensor, it would trigger an area. And then when you walk past another motion sensor, sensor, it would trigger another area. So um, eventually, you're just surrounded by all of this plastic.
and um, another artist we brought down um, from, uh, I, I had met him in Sumter, South Carolina, actually. This is Jonathan Brilliant. And he works with, um, he still to this day works pretty much only with those little coffee stir sticks that you get from Starbucks. They have to be the Starbucks ones for him. They apparently have the best material property. But, <laughs> but he can create the most amazing woven nests out of these things. I wish I had a view of the whole space. Um, but uh, he, they just start to take on these incredible curves, and he can really sculpt these yeah, sticks bit over time. They basically went across the entire space, so it was about 15 feet tall and 30 feet long of just undulating <laughs> coffee stir sticks. This is another show we did there. This is um, actually, this is all my work here. That's Wolfie in the foreground and Pigman in the background there. Um, and these are two of my, um, my characters based out of recurring dream characters um, that I, the way I work, you know, when I, I feel like uh, within dreams, you can, sorry, I should probably not no, even no, go no, into all No, 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 you can go into all that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I will, just for a little bit. So, you know, I started thinking more about, you know, just this idea of dreams. I was still really obsessed with this idea. Because I had noticed, you know, that I would sometimes dream about these recurring characters and these recurring places. And, you know, even since I was a little girl, I would always have, really, really vivid dreams, uh, up to the point of thinking, you, you know, not really realizing what was real, what was dream. And so I wanted to give these recurring characters this kind of active agency that we would normally only apply to people in waking life. I wanted to see if I could give them like a kind of narrative and a kind of history. So in order to invoke them back into my dreaming, I would create these kind of meticulous sculptures and tableaus of the sculptures interacting with each other um, in the hopes that it would trigger that kind of phenomenon where if you work all day on a thing, then you're more likely to dream about it at night. And so sometimes that would work for me and it would trigger this kind of lucid dreaming experience. And that was wonderful because then it would, you know, keep the, the narrative going. And um, in that way, I'm kind of able to advance this sort of internal story that um, leaves these artifacts behind, these artifacts of invocation, I think, of them. So after that first year in um, the 18 Rabbit space there, the landlord wanted his space back, which was understandable. But we had um, started talking to another landlord, uh, Doug McCraw, over in Fat Village. And he said, you know what? You guys are doing some cool stuff. Why don't you come over here? And he gave us a little kind of like office -y sort of space, and we turned that into the new 18 Rabbit and started making some shows there. And it was really nice to be part of um, an art village. If you guys haven't been to Fat Village, you should really come. It's on uh, the last, we have an art walk on the last Saturday of every month. We still do this. And there's always new shows and new studios. Um, but having this little space here kind of restricted the size of the work that we could show. Um, so there were these other large warehouse spaces that we started doing projects in. We just called them the project space. Um, and when I uh, decided to go back to grad school, we just kind of ended 18 Rabbit and kept the project spaces going. But really that's what turned out to be the, the most exciting spaces that we could possibly have worked with. You know, by this time, we had really kind of come to the idea that what we liked to do was this really large-scale, immersive installation. This is a piece that Peter and I collaborated on at the Hotel Biba um, with three of my characters, um, the three long-haired sisters. I call them the weird sisters. And we, um, we created this entire room out of branches things for them. It was part of a show called Showtell where um, basically the curator, um, Kara Walker, Walker told me that, um, convinced this hotel that it would be a good idea to have artists come in, take over all their unused rooms and create like a series of installations in all of these rooms. It was a great idea and um, every room you walked into was a whole different experience so we were lucky enough to be invited up to take part in this show. Um, after that, we worked. Uh, we went back to Spartanburg, South Carolina, 
um, they asked us to put something in one of the parks there they had just opened. Um, it was going to be called the Arts Park, but up to that moment it didn't have any art in it, so we figured we would help them solve that problem. So we worked on this piece we called the Peaceable Kingdom. Um, this is my truck filled with them. They basically took a series of cutouts of it, sort of the uh, native animals you would find in that space. Sort of, mostly native animals you'd find in that space. Cats don't tend to be native. Cats but are <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, we created stencils and spray painted these things, and we kind of let the park get taken over by the animals that would have ordinarily have been there. And, um, you know, working still in like a like kind of large scale way, um, I worked with um, FAU's uh, gallery in uh, Jupiter to create this piece I call Clinging Vines uh, Cannot Stand Alone. And so, let me just flip through here. There's an installation here of that piece. And so it's incorporating um, some of my animal people sculpture, the recurring dream characters, um, into um, a narrative that's actually um, stemming from one of the sisters' hair. This is Isabel, and I see her as being sort of the narrator out of the three sisters. Um, so she's creating this landscape with her hair. There's a detail. So this is all hair that's pinned to the wall. And then it just kind of flows around the gallery space through the characters. Um, so it was really this kind of work that was making us want and require really a larger space. So um, getting to work in the projects, this is a view of the projects now. We have um, Hawks from MSG come back and paint a mural on that one too. We thought he did such a good job the first time. Um, so we started working with this space um, just all the time <laughs> and it really changed the way that we approach work, you know? Yeah. It had to. It's about 10,000 square feet um, to the first beam in the ceiling. It's 19 <laughs> feet and higher than that at the, at the peak. It's a kind of a domed roof. And uh, when we first uh, started working with these spaces, you know, we had maybe a six-foot step ladder. So for the first couple of shows, we had to figure out creative ways of lighting everything. Um, yeah, we had no lights either. <laughs> we had no lights. We just had a big space that yeah. was, like, dark with no lights and just, like, fluorescent with all the lights. So we started working with light. So this was a piece we both worked on with a few other artists, uh, Christian Fennick and Chris Kwan, um, where it was actually for a fundraising party for a studio that was planning on moving into the neighborhood called the New Faces of Hollywood. And our idea was that how can we create something that really interacts with the light that's projected upon it. So we took that same um, saran wrap working web technique, which actually those guys were also playing with, and um, we all worked together to create one large uh, neural structure. Um, with Jamie Grimes, an artist from um, South Carolina, he's from Alabama. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alabama came down and he put together this piece on the roof, which sort of almost looked like a, a floating coral or clouds. But everything in this show we had painted white or had made translucent so that as it l was lit and with multicolored changing lights, it took on different lives and different, um, well, different, it became a completely different environment, a completely alien space. Um, we continued working with these spaces. This was actually one of our early Nocturne show where we had taken trees that we just cut down some weed trees from out back and set them up throughout the space. So instead of walking into a gallery, you're walking into sort of almost a forest. So the first thing you encountered was trees that you had to navigate through to go and see the artwork. Um, this was also in the back of that space, also with uh, Christian Fennick and Chris Kwan. We worked together to create this uh, spider web taking over the entire back of the space. Um, well, let's flip to the next slide. The, um, this piece was, actually this was right at the cusp. We had just started to get lights. We didn't quite have a good way of getting up to the ceiling yet. So this was a work by Donna Haynes. And actually to hang this piece, we had to Indiana Jones it where we took a carabiner and some rope and tried to throw them over the, uh, the beams. But it not worked out. <laughs> um, but it was part of our uh, Artists of Fat Village show that we put on there that year. That was another. 
I don't think anybody heard that. Um, with this piece, um, Leah and I work together. We're working more with um, optics and reflection. So it's just a series of panes of glass. They're not very clean panes of glass, which actually makes it work better. Um, whereby the person standing in front of it gets recorded. That camera uh, sends the info to the uh, projector, which then projects the image of the person being recorded through those panes of glass, sort of shooting the light back at the person. And the, the effect is um, this sort of refraction and reflection of light that basically scatters the light and spreads it all over the space. Um, at the same time, I was still getting more and more into like digital work and CNC production and computer-aided, you know, computer-aided fabrication. Um, with this piece, I took a simple model, like a simple butterfly, like a, one of those popular butterfly models you get at a um, museum store, cut all the endpoints in half so that I could create a um, sort of a seed and use that to build a structure. So each butterfly is sort of doubled over and each one kind of, kind of links it back into the other one so that in the end you create a tapestry out of this one object. So it becomes like a seed to create a larger piece. Yeah, so there's only two of them here, but it could be infinite. We also um, started opening up the space for uh, some independent curation. This is a show that Lisa curated recently called Rep and Tumble. Um, you know, we started realizing working with all these amazing artists that we weren't the only ones out there that had ideas of, you know, what was linking the ideas of our fellow artists. So we thought we would share the space, and now we accept proposals. Um, if you have an awesome idea for a show, you should just come talk to us. Cause um, we really, really love kind of sharing the space in that way. Um, we. It also keeps the space fresh. It always keeps the space full of energy. And a lot of times, you know, and people seem to come back because they sometimes never know what they're going to get, you know, because we do tend to bring in a lot of different curators. Mm -hmm. This was from the um, Ripper to Shred show, curated by Millie Cardoso, um, with some work by Jackie Tuffer, these wire dresses. This is a piece by the artist group 3DQ out of Miami. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but it's like a giant uh, steel cube. This is one piece wooden. in the entire, what? It was wooden. Oh, it was? Yeah. Okay, sorry, giant wooden like frame of a cube that had like um, black plastic wraps stretched between the beams and the ceiling down to the cube itself. And then within it are um, projected uh, Stanley Kubrick movies. And so it kind of shines out through the, the slack, like, like light shining through vertical blinds. Um, this is a piece by Balam Soto. It's an um, interactive digital piece whereby you basically are given this little box, kind of looks like that box on the screen. And as you play with it and manipulate it, the box on the screen also, you know, adjust, reacts to what you're doing and also creates music to go along with it. This was part of a show where um, we called it Catalyst, where we were focusing on like how people are using technology to create um, new artworks. Um, sort of related to that show is this other show we called Modded, where, you know, <laughs> that guy right there knows what this is all about. Uh, um, by Ryan Farrell. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually uh, bicycles that when um, you have a group of people riding them, uh, they light up a series of headlamps on top of the structure. And it's kind of about the idea of creating community through this group effort, yeah. which um, we think really kind of represents exactly what we're trying to do. Um, with this piece, um, again, we're playing, this is one of our own pieces, we're playing with the idea of um, projected light as a medium unto itself. And so with this piece, uh, we've created this uh, mist screen where um, a, the image of a galloping horse is actually projected through it. It's sort of hard to see in this picture, but there's the horse's head. So it's sort of that like Moybridge galloping horse. And so it's like horses in the mist. Mm -hmm. And when it gets projected through the mist, it almost ends up being like a hologram. Um, so you could walk through and it has like a very cooling effect. And in the background there, that's another piece that Peter created. Um, up. I have a better slide of it up. 
Yeah. So the, yeah, with this we used a, well I guess I used a process called photogametry, which is a process whereby you can take um, still photography around an object um, and use that to recreate a three-dimensional object in digital space, let's say. Um, the issue is, though, you tend to end up with these cancered objects. So we took advantage of that. I was actually holding Leia on my back at that point. And we had a friend walk around and take photographs. And you ended up with this sort of like hunchbacked um, monster that I recreated in um, slot-notched wood. I think it's like 13 feet tall. Mm -hmm. Really? you know, taking it, trying to take advantage of the skill that that, um, that Actually, that yeah, that was actually also in the Jupiter campus. So it had a, I think the ceiling was about 30 feet tall. So that was about as, that was uh, me trying to go up as opposed to, it was a very tall and narrow space. So I saw what Peter was doing with um, these digital fabrication processes and I thought it was amazing. I wanted to try my hand um, add digital fabrication as well. So I created this piece, um, I call it in, in this iteration, this piece has three lines at this point. In this view, um, I see her as Ophelia, and I wanted it to look as though this kind of giant text was um, emerging from the water. Uh, the head itself is about uh, eight feet long by four feet wide, <laughs> just the size that we'll in the bed of our uh, F-150 pickup truck. <laughs> have to make everything break down to that size. Um, but uh, this is a, a digitally designed, so uh, it was a computer model before I um, rounded it out in foam and then covered it all entirely with a foam coat, like an exterior foam coat, and then um, a boat uh, kind of paint. Please, the library will be shown tomorrow. We'll be closing in 30 minutes. If you need to attend the library for the checkout material, please apply for one at this time. So, um, so it's actually hollow on the inside. And then for its second iteration, I turned it upside down because I just, you know, I kept wanting to see what it was like the other way around. And here I call it the dreamer and the dreamed. Um, so I was thinking, you know, about these these recurring dream characters, and I was thinking, you know, they have all the appearance of um, of a consciousness of their own. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to kind of illustrate that with this piece. So I see the dreamer being the, um, the large head that's floating, and then her dream is the figure that's resting on top. And then that figure actually is playing with dolls in a dollhouse, so maybe even extending the cycle. Um, I, we work a lot with Christian Fennick and Chris Kuan to create these installations. This is one they created out of flagging tape for one of our Nocturnes show. And we actually recreated this. Um, I worked with them to recreate this again just recently except this time I instead of lighting it with the standard lighting techniques we took uh, projectors and basically used an interactive lighting technique so in this case all the projectors are mapping the scene below them so that you know if you wave your arms or the sculpture which is made of flagging tape constantly shakes and shimmers uh, it'll change the color of the light going through it so um, this was sort of a detail of what the um, digital effect would look like just looking at a webcam and well, Leia standing in the living room. Um, so that sort of really spiked, that sort of has gotten me more and more excited about actually programming materials, working with these large um, spaces, these very raw spaces. I mean, no matter what you do in Fat Village, it sometimes becomes interactive. Um, so like, trying to work with that, you know, how do you uh, take advantage of this interactivity that people expect in that space. Um, I worked on a more, I guess, physically interactive piece using a ball jointed, um, a ball jointed matrix that I CNC routed out and allowed people to play with kind of like a giant spider like marionette. Yeah, it's like, you know, uh, like in computer modeling, um, how you have that mesh this is just like that. This is exactly what that computer mesh is like, um, except in this case, you physically enter into it, and when you pull and push on these sticks, then you're seeing this kind of mesh marionette take shape in front of you. Um, but 
and with that, I started to get more and more into computer programming. So recently, I've worked on this process whereby um, that guy up in front with a little green dot on his head, that's an EEG reader, so that's reading his uh, brain waves. And it's using that to um, create a, an image. I call the piece Mind Draw, where it basically measures 11 different sets of brain waves to control like colors and shapes on a screen so that you can basically draw like directly from the mind, kind of that idea of like a direct translation. Um, this is the digital, uh, dig an example of the digital image that you can create. So this was one of the first ones that I created. Um, and it's all based off different um, parameters of your mind. So you can actually start to gain control over it. It's very difficult to control, but because you can adjust your brain waves, um, you can actually take some control over it. So like, um, actually Leia was quite good at adjusting her brain waves. She was able to make a completely green picture. Um, generally the colors range from green to orange to red, but you can control the up and down motion and the left and right motion. And they're actually using similar processes like this to control, uh, to allow people to control artificial limbs. Um, taking that same you know, taking that same language that was you know, so malleable and allowed me to uh, create those sorts of experiences, I started working on this piece that I call In the Woods, where um, I took over one of the South Warehouse spaces, creating these large screens. The largest one is about 12 feet by 10 feet. Um, the smallest one is 6 feet by 8 feet. Um, through these screens, I projected a, a light-based um, image that looked and at what was going on to create a basically an abstracted color field from it. So in this one I have four different projectors four and four different computers all running four different programs. And they're all looking at the center of the space interpreting what's going on in there. So I was hoping to kind of create a non-human dialogue whereby like what was happening inside the space was a conversation between these like four different entities and as the viewer you could walk in and become part of that conversation and have affect change upon the situation but your presence in some ways wasn't necessarily needed. Um, this is a picture of what the image kind of looks like with just a webcam recording which sort of helps you imagine what's going on. I mean there's Leia up there there's my head and there's our dog Jasper down at the bottom. <laughs> so in some ways I like the way that these sort of non-human entities can interpret what's going on and that can interpret a scenario. So the last piece that, um, that we wanted to show, is um, this is the most recent piece that I've made. Um, this was, I call this piece the Weird Sisters. It's actually kind of a hard view to see it from. This is a view from above um, in the Museum of Art in Fort Lauderdale. Um, from the side here, you can see it's kind of like a big tree stump. And then the, the three long-haired sisters are like the roots, and their hair kind of weaves up. And these kind of bed sheets that are over them um, climb up this tree and become like the dresses of these three animal people that maybe they're dreaming themselves into or creating some kind of spell or magic with. Um, so uh, this piece was on display up until recently in um, the Museum of Art Fort Lauderdale, but now we have it in um, our current show, Nocturne, in the project. Um, it's Nocturne's Hyperstition. Um, all the work in this show is dealing with fictions made real. So things like um, alien abductions and dreams and um, moments of contact. Um, has a new edition of some extra trees. But um, I do hope that you'll join us. We have a closing reception for this show on November 30th from 7 to 11. It's got several wonderful uh, artists in it. Some of them are in the audience tonight. And, um, and that's it. Thank you so much for, for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, like 3D printers? 3D printers, yeah. yeah. Um, what would you like to know about them? I was wondering, you know, they're limited, are they limited in size now? Because they 
they're they're getting better all the time. There's actually a, a company out. There's a professor out in um, California at the University of South Carolina, USC in California, <laughs> um, and he's working on a system whereby he can 3D print full houses. So his uh, his goal is to create a you know 2,000 square foot house in 20 hours. So it's just like you know right now they're small, but the the technology when you blow it up is the same technology. So I'm actually building my own 3D printer right now, which I want to be able to print like. Uh, like podium sized things with it. That'll be in the show in March. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be really interesting to see what you guys do with that technology. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the digital technologies are just amazing. And as I think as artists we need to get more involved in the digital because it's you know, it's like having a fabrication company working for you in some ways, you know. Yeah. So you still have, you're given that, the building, the warehouse, mm -hmm. is given by the owner? Well, we've entered into a business partnership with him. So we work together to produce these shows. And we also do event rentals in the space. And, mm -hmm. yeah. They're, um, <laughs> they're tough to sell. No. They're tough to sell. You know, sales are few and far between. Um, generally, um, Fellowships and grants are the way that installation artists are able to make a living in this world. And events. As and events, well. yeah. And events, yeah. So I've been reinstalling the in the woods piece around town for different events, so that helps out. Yeah. Like the light one. Is that up there now? Um, it's not up there now. Last week it was uh, I had set it up for the Beaux Arts down in the south in the universe, or the museum down there. And actually this weekend it's going to be taking part in some sort of uh, what what have what it's the, the opening reception um, for the new bar stash. It's like a nineteen twenties speakeasy. Um, it's in downtown Fort Lauderdale and they're having um, an event with this whiskey that they put up into space. <laughs> Run up and down so you can all drink space whiskey, and Peter's installation will be there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's these sorts of things that help you kind of like. Uh, One more question. Are you going to do something with Art Basel this year? We're talking to them right now about reinstalling his In the Woods sculpture um, and also my uh, Large Weird Sisters sculpture. Which one? Well, that's, we're, still, we're still talking to a couple of different people, so. Yeah. Can't reveal all my secrets tonight. Did you have a question, Ali? Well, when, Peter, when you were describing that wooden 13 foot tool, mm -hmm. uh, we had seen it as well. Could you talk again about how you get the, the technology that buy so Um Basically, there's a process called like photogametry. And it's actually gotten a lot better since I built it, which was not even that long ago. It just goes so fast, you can't barely keep up. Whereby you basically take photographs around a three-dimensional object or a person or you can take photographs around a scene and it basically stitches those things together to create a three-dimensional object and you can then take that three-dimensional object and I divided it up using a program called um, Rhino and CNC routed it so all the um, pieces were actually cut by a uh, computer controlled um, uh, cutting arm that based so it was then to take all those pieces and then assembled it, which I think the hardest part was actually reassembling all the tiny pieces because I didn't do a good enough job of marking out which piece went where. It was the hardest puzzle that we ever put together. It took like three days of like... <laughs> but it well, came together. But it came together, for the most part. We got a couple of spots wrong, but we made them work. Um, does that explain that well enough? We'll talk to you more about it later. Yeah. <laughs> we'll show you what we um, mean. It's pretty cool. Then do you do you assemble it and reassemble it someplace else? Uh, yeah, the, we've uh, taken it and moved it twice. And the nice thing about working digitally is that there is like no original object. So like in some ways it doesn't matter. Like the object is sort of the digital information and not the individual iteration. So it can also be just recut out in a different material and reassembled anywhere. But theoretically, you could pack it flat. It's just a slot-notch construction. So um, each of the pieces just 
kind of pop together, and then you have this big pop together sculpture. Um, in practice, it's you know a little harder than it is in theory, but I think that if I think if we keep working at it, that we'll be able to get the angles just right to be able to actually pop these kind of things. Together Way harder easier. than IKEA. <laughs> yeah. Actually... Did you have a question, Amy? Um, you know, unless a piece of sculpture is specifically interactive, you know, you're generally told not to touch. Yeah. Now, with, with the corpse girl yeah. in the puddle, uh, you saw when they had a chance to actually interact with the sculpture, they ripped her apart. Did you ever find out from anybody why they were so destroyed? Well, no, but I, you know, I, I thought about it an awful lot afterwards. And you know, I don't think that they realized that there was an art community just up the street. Um, and I think it probably just took them by surprise. I think it scared them, and I think they were probably, you know, took out their anger, you know, because of, of that fear. Um, but I, I, I didn't know when I created it that South Carolina was number one in the country for domestic violence. So in that regard, it kind of took on this additional meaning, I thought. Uh, so they're giving a workshop tomorrow in casting and mold making with plaster, alginate, and um, foam uh, in the ceramics studio across the way tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Uh, if you have time, please fill out a survey. They're on the seats in places because that will help us with your feedback. Um, and there's three more talks in the series next semester or next year. Um, Amy Gross is here. She's going to be giving one in April. So. Um, mark those dates if you're interested in hearing from more artists from South Florida. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, there's quotes of artists from their show around as well. Make sure you see that if you're interested in seeing the chat below. Yes.